a Living History production. This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and I'm back at the Australian War Memorial, one of my favourite places to come. And about this time last year, I was here and we did a fantastic panel discussion with some great historians from the War Memorial. Uh, and I wanted to do it again. So I've reassembled the team that we spoke to uh, this time last year. Um, and we're going to have a talk about the future of remembrance. I'm going to ask these learned historians to look into their crystal ball and just make some predictions about how Anzac and remembrance is going to look in the future. And there's no other people better place to do this than obviously the talented historians at the Australian War Memorial. Um, why don't we start by introducing ourselves. On my left, we have Dr. Carl James. Dr. Carl James, I'm the head of the military history section, and I think I now qualify as a regular contributor I think to the Living do. History Podcast. You've probably done more episodes, I think, than anyone, Carl, by this stage. I well, I, I've now run out of at least on my secondhand uh, fingers to count, so... I've done it quite a few now. Thanks for having me. No, it's, it's always a pleasure to have you here, mate. And uh, Aaron, what do you Yeah, to? my Dr. Aaron Pegram. Uh, I'm senior historian in the military history section, and I've just started a new role at the memorial as the concept leader for the Middle East Current Conflicts Galleries and the new memorials redevelopment project. Um, I, too, have had a couple of uh, Matt McLaughlin sort of uh, podcasts up my sleeve. I, I must, must run as the... The, uh, the second rate. Whenever Carl's not available, Matt comes to comes to me for for the second rate material. So I, I you know, thank you all for persevering. Well, no, you um, you've done some wonderful podcasts, particularly related to your area, especially on the First World War. And a recent podcast uh, that we've recorded is on your new book that's just come out, Surviving mm -hmm. the Great War. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? There's a, there's a, there's a whole separate podcast about it that people can go and look up, but just give us a quick overview. Yeah, it's so, quite an extraordinary project. So uh, Surviving the Great War, Australian Prisoners of War on the Western Front uh, documents the, uh, the story, the little known story of the 3,841 Australians who were taken prisoner by German forces in, uh, in the fighting on the Western Front and their subsequent experiences in German captivity. Uh, they endured a broad range of experiences from the exceedingly bad to the, um, you know, actually had it was a quite a good time in captivity. The vast majority of them survived and returned home. Uh, which may not have been the case had there remained fighting on the in the trenches of the Western Front. So very unique and uh, a, a project that's very dear to my heart. It took me nearly 13 years to, to complete, so I urge you all to go out and buy the book and at least listen to Matt's podcast. Well, the, the book's available now, so go and grab a copy of it and then um, look out for that podcast in the new year. It's uh, an absolutely fascinating topic and I really enjoyed talking to you about it, Aaron. It was fantastic. Next to you. Yeah. Roger Lee. Yeah, good day. Um, I'm Roger Lee. I'm the currently um, suffering as the author of the Iraq volume of the current uh, official history project that the, the War Memorial is sponsoring. So I'm writing the official history of Australia's in, uh, military involvement in the war uh, starting in 2003 and finishing in two, uh, 2011. It's proving to be quite a challenge, but nonetheless. But of more important, given what we're just talking about, I had the pleasure yesterday of, of launching uh, Aaron's book, uh, which meant that I had to read it. And uh, I, I can actually say that um, while Aaron was down the pub last weekend, I was at home reading his book. And I actually thought I got the better part of the deal because it's quite a good book. So um, I'd recommend it pretty highly to you if you have any interest in the First World War. Although I do have to correct him. His book says there were 3,482 prisoners. Of Mere the details. Germans. Statistics. <laughs> <laughs> and that just proves I read it. It's um, There's... There's some really good books coming out at the moment, aren't there? I'm, it's, we seem to be in a place where there's lots of really interesting new research being done and lots of good new books being published. Um, it does seem to be a bit of a good time for military history. Do you feel that in your position at the Australian War Memorial? Uh, it's an interesting question because I think in many ways the onset of social media and the ability to do research online has certainly assisted, uh, facilitated our story, well, our experience and our availability to research. So for example, once upon a time, you had to go to an archive as in travel either to Canberra for the National Archives of the War Memorial or the National Library, for example, um, take the big trip over to the UK or to the United States. Whereas these days, it's actually a lot easier and much more accessible to look on another museum and archives website, request material. Uh, yeah, you usually need to pay a fee, um, but you can get material copied. So for example, when working on the siege to Brook, while I've still gone to the UK, because you can get through more research material when you're there in situ. I've also ordered material online from the, the Bovington Tank Museum, the National Archives in the UK, 
um, the Liddell Hart Center for Military Studies. So it, it does make things a lot easier. And you also have things such as Trove, for example, which is the National Library's fantastic, wonderful database of historic newspaper articles. So it makes it a lot easier to follow through individuals and to tell the individual story through um, what was said in, say, The Age or the Sydney Morning Herald or the Illawarra Mercury from 100 years ago. So it makes it a lot easier, I think. So it's certainly... Like, I've been a big advocate, as you know, of saying this is an exciting time for us to, to tell our stories. Um, and I think it's certainly... There's never been more of a public interest and debate in, in military history, or Australian military history, but as, as well as military history. Um, it does seem to go from strength to strength and asking a lot of new questions, new areas, such as, you know, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, their experiences during war. Um, queer history, for example, is now looking at the experiences of gay, lesbian and transgender men and women in the Defence Forces. So we're opening it up in whole ways and means of... Um, asking new questions. So it's pretty exciting, I think. We dug into it in detail a few months ago, Carl, in another panel discussion we had here at the War Memorial, and that was great to get the perspective of historians about the new era of accessibility, um, of being able to do research without having to spend, you know, fly across the other side of the world and spend hours in archives. Uh, it comes with a downside as well, that if everyone has a voice, potentially the some of the quality of the, of the words being spoken are not as good as they would otherwise be but I, I also like the doctrine that 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 quantity has its own quality as well that if enough people are talking and if there's enough of a discussion that often the uh, the, the right stuff comes out so it's a fascinating time i guess that just goes to show you too that history isn't finite i mean just because a book exists on a particular subject doesn't necessarily mean that's the book that's that's it you know we've got a history's got to crack on because it's all about enge- opening uh the subject to new and engaging discussions that the, what makes history so the practice of history so rich and rewarding is the vast uh, array of different stories and different voices that add a different different dimension to an existing subject. So I mean, uh, there may be there's I think there's new and exciting material out there. And that's uh, that's part of the the benefits of that. What do you think about it, Roger? Because you're not mm. as avid a user of social media as no. potentially the rest of us are. Oh, just let that garbage truck go past. <laughs> um, I actually have a slightly different view, and I'm slightly more concerned. Um, I'm seeing, from the way I look at it, that history is now starting to become a bit more um, used for different purposes. Uh, there are a couple of Australian uh, alleged military historians who write popular military history who use it to push, in my view, uh, um, a view of Australians that's perhaps not true. And, and I'm a bit concerned that while there's a growth in the interest in military history, there seems to be a serious decline in the study and the education of military historians. So while there are more people writing history, there are fewer people doing history at universities. I mean, when I first graduated, every major university had a large history faculty. And nearly all university universities offered postgraduate training and education as historians, not military historians, but as historians. If you look around the universities in Australia now, there are very few pure history departments. An awful lot of them are now subsumed into, you know, social studies or whatever else. And there are fewer and fewer areas that seem to be teaching the profession of the historian in the same way that it was taught to the three of us, which is, you know, how to evaluate evidence, how to weigh up competing stories how do you decide between competing narratives where do you look for i mean truth's a much abused word but where do you look for an objective view on what happened as opposed to one that's being presented to you in a certain way and the classic example i always use is the story of australia's quote great world war one soldier uh, simpson I mean, there are so many myths and, and, and interpretations of the Simpson story out there. 90% of them are done for reasons separate from what Simpson did and who Simpson was. They're used in support of an ideology of somebody, of, of a nation which is caring, sharing and wonderful, uh, anti-militaristic. Also. So, I mean, if you want to have a hero in the First World War and you're anti-militarist, how do you do it? Well, you find a stretcher bearer. He's obviously not killing anybody. He's putting he's brave because he's going out there and doing things under fire so you take this story and you apply it to your ideology whether Simpson shared that or not seems to be irrelevant and and that that's how it's coming across now so you know the warm world's got this wonderful statue of Simpson his donkey uh, don't tell Brendan but I'd melt the damn thing down and use it for something else 
um, because I think it's actually part of uh, it's part of this mythologizing of our history. Well, how do we, how do we balance that though? I mean, all of us well, sitting here have a stake in. It, it's a problem, and it's called it's called the the, the law of market forces. Uh, I mean, I remember being hissed vigorously once for giving my views on Simpson to a bunch of Victorian high school history teachers who thought that I was attacking the man. And I kept trying to explain to them, can't you distinguish between me commenting on the man and commenting on the myth? But they couldn't see that. They didn't, going back to my original thought, I don't think they'd been trained in how to evaluate competing stories. The first story they read is the one they believe. Uh, And for me, that's becoming a bit of a concern because that's growing. Yeah. That's not specific about history, though. That's um, about the news, yeah. the press, uh, well, the, the ability to think critically about sources. Yep. You know, the whole yep. premise now, fake news, for example. Yep. Um, we use that as a bit of a joke, but it is, it's a thing. And, and the use and abuse of history isn't... I oh, it's not see where, where yeah. Roger is coming from. Uh, and I think in many ways, Australian military history as a genre has probably been beneficial in the way it's been... Uh, well, a strength, not maybe strength, but part of the reason why I think Australian military history is popular is because it is easily tied to and can be abused and manipulated for mm. political, ideological purposes. Um, and certainly, I think our, all of us here at different points of time have been called out, not necessarily called out, people have engaged with what we've been arguing. Um, so you've had it over Simpson. I've had it over my views of the significance and importance of Kokoda and the Kokoda Trail. Um regular hate mail um but it also kind of comes with the territory part of being a public historian or a professionally trained historian and a battlefield guide and the tourism we we all think we have something to say and we kind of put our head up above the parapet and you expect Mm. to be shot at Um, but part of what i think we can do here is to put out good quality stuff for example and that maybe the market or the people think and evaluate what it is and to make their own choices and to empower them to think well this is a great story about an individual but let's learn a little bit more and i think part of something i'm always very mindful of being a historian at the at the war memorial and really me working here is my only real grown-up job i've ever probably had outside of university but it's not to come across as a gatekeeper um to say this is a topic that's worth studying this is a topic that we shouldn't be studied i i am of the view that i think military history and australian military history is a very broad church um and we need to look at it from many different ways but that shouldn't mean that we dumb it down because uh, a part of it, while individual stories are a great book, so for me, for example, it was my grandparents, their experiences during the Second World War, that was my first in to the topic uh, and my interest in the Second World War. But then from that, you then can ask some bigger questions as to what does this mean? Why is it important? So why does Simpson, why did Simpson do what he did? What does that connect to Australian national identity or why does it not? Um, so I think there's lots of different ways and different approaches mm-hmm. to consider. Uh, and, and the law of the market it. comes into this as well, uh, and we all see this. I mean, I've just launched Aaron's book. If Aaron sells more than 5,000 copies of that book in Australia, he'll be doing very well. But our more popular historians who present it in a way which is less rigorous, less well-balanced, less argued, less evidence-based, will sell 10 times that and make money. So, in a sense, the, it's a big challenge. You know, If you're trying to make a living as a historian which a couple of my friends have tried and very few have ever succeeded in making a professional living as a historian. Do you write your history in such a way that it sells or do you write your history in such a way that it tells what you consider to be a balanced, well, objective story? This is a uniquely Australian problem in some ways because... Uh, not really. Our, not really. It, it just in this respect that the adoration for the subject of Anzac and remembrance, you know, which, which is obviously all-encompassing in Australia, um, is wonderful yet also comes with a darker side that as you say roger it's the do we reach a point where now that there's no first world war veterans and soon to be no second world war veterans do we reach a point where people say i don't care i I only want the myth do we reach Mm. a point where people start to say that's all i care about i I want to remember them that way they're not here to tell me i'm wrong why do you historians keep trying to challenge my perception of what it means to be australian and what the anzacs did and why it's such an important day I think the answer to that is actually quite the reverse, is that people have grown up with the myths and legends and learning all about grandpa's wartime experiences and the war stories and all that sort of stuff. Uh, And they're they're actively going out, listening to podcasts, reading books, visiting the Australian War Memorial in such vast quantities. And there's such a, a, a voracious appetite for this content that historians are challenging people's perspectives that the popular writers uh i mean they they serve a purpose and perhaps get people initially interested in a particular subject 
if that then fulfills them, if that then uh, spurs the that person on to go read uh, other books about Monash, about the course and conduct of fighting on the Western Front, about Roger's favourite subject, Hague. Mm. Um, I mean, I mean, then that's mission My success. <laughs> I I think as military historians or as historians in general, um, not just specific to military history, if you're not challenging accepted myths and stereotypes uh, in the course of the production of your work, then you're doing something wrong. I mean, yes, it's an objective assessment. You've only got to look at the way the Americans at the moment, and, and they're my go-to example because I, I see them once a year and uh, I, I go over to a big conference of American historians, seven or 800 of us sit around, of which there will be three or four Australians, a couple of Brits, and the rest are all Americans, 90% of whom are working in the American Civil War. It's a never-ending open industry. And the good thing about that is the Americans are not frightened to say, you hold this view about this American general, well, you're wrong for this reason, and away they go and the arguments happen. We don't, we haven't yet successfully got that, I think, into our culture enough yet. No, we're still locked into um, the individual, the the experience of the digger. I think um, Jeff Gray in the 1990s argued that while we have the bean tradition, which is a great um, element of telling and focusing on the experiences of the single individual, such as Simpsons or Private Giles, for example, uh, it's also limited our approach to history and historiography in Australia, at least formally, and even in universities too, where it is just about what Grandad did in the war, not why is it important, what does it mean? Mm. And while there is a wide level of interest, um, it doesn't necessarily equate to, equate to critical and quality thinking. So partly it comes down to, I think, how do you identify yourself? Are you a historian? Are you a storyteller or a historian? Um, as some other people Somebody said. to be, yes. um, or is it just you? You know, you you really want to see how your family relates to that wider national narrative. So, for me, it does come back to trying to be really broad and inclusive, and to ask lots of new questions. But you still would want to have that um, ability of critical thought and critical thinking. The interesting thing with the First World War, for example, Roger, is it a strike as a Second World War historian? How um, there are always some hot topics. Um, but in the main, you don't get the same level of detailed critical thought and critical thinking and a wider understanding of, say, Australia's involvement in the Second World War or even some of those Second World War battles that you get for the First World War. I think British First World War historiography is far more advanced than, say, the, the, the approach to what we do with the Second World War, for mm. example. Here you talk about a single campaign, Bougainville, Tobruk, Kokoda, Ch- uh, Singapore, but you don't and you're possibly not able to get down to the same level of detailed discussion about um, individual actions, commanders. I mean, there's no real equivalent of Hague in the Second World War. I mean, we've got some great individual personalities. Oh, I know, you MacArthur. The, I mean, there's, there's but, somebody you can all learn to love. <laughs> you don't get the same level of impassioned debate about MacArthur. Uh, and certainly, you oh, know, very. Should. you don't get about around Blamey, for example, or what about mm. Morshead mm. as a... a um, as a battlefield commander, Berryman, um, Red Robbie Robertson, who personally I think is a little bit overrated, mm. but um, you just don't kind of get the same level of detailed discussion, I think, as you do with, say, our involvement in the First World War. Is that a consequence of size? Second World War is a much more complex, much more involved, uh, and it's just so big. To one, I mean, I find the First World War story difficult to get my head around, and we only had 360-odd thousand soldiers in it. Second World War, we have over a million people in uniform. That's just that's a big number. Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Half a million Australians serve overseas. Yeah. Um, you have in Australian units and individuals serving all around the world. In 1945, for example, we're fighting seven Australian forces are involved in seven major campaigns just in the Pacific, in addition to our air crew. So there's still something like 20,000 Australians in Europe in 1945. Uh, it, it is a much bigger war, and it's a much more complex. I feel much more complicated war, and it doesn't have a simple narrative because you can follow you know Tobruk, um, Fall of Singapore, Kokoda and then usually in many popular stories of the Pacific War uh, it kind of stops and then so you don't get the level the detailed discussions of say Lay, Finchhafen, hmm. um, uh, the Salamala, Ramu, Ma, Ramu, Marku, uh, the Ramu Valley campaigns and the Markham Valley for example. So the 1943 offensive was the largest military campaign Australians have ever fought but it's also very hard to get your head around. I think the what this says to me is, is what we touched on earlier in the interview, is that history is an evolving story. It's not carved in stone. It's not sitting on a shelf just waiting for you to come and, and access it. And that's really what I want to talk about today. The Because I, I do feel we're in a bit of a period of transition in the way that Australians think about military history. And 
And I am fascinated to know what you think, what all, what you all think about how this is going to look in future years. Obviously, we won't hold you to this. There's no money at stake. We're not going to we're not going to hold you to this. But well, let's start with your institution, the Australian War Memorial. The Australian War Memorial is going through a big period of change. Where we're sitting right now is in a, a portable room outside the War Memorial because you are very short of space. Um, the expansion of the War, War Memorial has not been without its critics. Um, talk to me about that. Talk to me about the role the War Memorial currently plays. One of the things I did want to talk about is I did an interview for the podcast with Brendan Nelson a few months ago and he put forward something which I was not expecting and hadn't really thought of before that one of the key roles of the War Memorial is to help currently serving defence members um, deal with their service and relate to their service. That was not something that I had thought of before. I thought that had always been a benefit of the War Memorial. Of course, that's happened since the institution opened, that veterans would come and show their families the displays and talk about what they did in the war. But as a specific role of the institution to formally assist serving members deal with their service, I was quite surprised. Talk to me, and on whatever topic you would like to, but about the evolving nature of the War Memorial and, and how you see this institution operating in the future. So when the Australian War Memorial opened in 1941, it was a memorial to Australians in their service during the First World War. Uh, it just happened to coincide with the outbreak of the Second World War and the significant actions that the Australians were then fighting Uh, all across uh, the globe uh, during that time. So very quickly, right from the outset, the War Memorial, uh, its purpose shifted and changed to include the experiences of of not just one group of Australian servicemen and women, but also a whole bunch of others. And that's, 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 it's been the memorial story ever since day one is all, all has been this sort of shifting and evolving mission to include more and more and more. Um, to the point where nearly 80 years down the track, uh, we uh, have embarked on several major projects and several major galleries to help tell the story of Australians in the Middle East conflict, specifically the Gulf War, uh, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, most recently Syria. Uh, Not to mention the vast numbers of Australian peacekeepers that have been on deployment uh, since 1948. And I mean, we, an element of their story was told uh, in a, sort of an addendum to uh, our post-45 conflicts gallery. Um, we, in order to tell their story, we had to have objects in the collection, which is actually very difficult to do when these conflicts are still on running. I mean, when we, when we opened the first, our brand new and refurbished First World War gallery, we'd, we'd been collecting objects for well over 100 years and we had the pick of the bunch. Um, I mean, we're at a stage now where the War Memorial uh, actually sends teams of curators and historians to overseas deployments, to, to military operations, to, to tag items that are currently in service with the Australian Defence Force. So at the end of their service life, they will be repatriated or brought back uh, either through AMAB or, or throughout the defence system and hopefully end up here in Australia. Um, those teams of curators and historians go out taking photos. They do oral history interviews with people in the field uh, so that we can then bring that back those objects and collections back that help inform uh our continuing story so um i you're right i mean the 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 funding situation has has been controversial uh and certainly a lot of people have been questioning whether or not 500 million dollars is uh well worth spending for uh for the memorial um i live in a world where it's happening <laughs> uh, i don't i don't get to have a buy-in into a big broader debate um but uh my my new role at the memorial is is as concept leader for the middle east modern conflicts galleries so um like i said we do have some items on display and we have an area within the memorial that tells the story of australians specifically in afghanistan we had uh the afghanistan the australian story uh which was opened in 2013 Um, which uh, was our first cut of telling that story. Uh, The mission in Afghanistan, Operation Slipper, had had not yet ended. Um, And I think there's a bit of a difficulty in terms of of telling that story in a historical context when the the mission is still ongoing, or there hasn't been at least a historical perspective. Um, We suffered from a problem of not having objects. I mean, we may have had bush masters that have have been um, crumped by IEDs. We have large technology items that perhaps or as labs we have uh aerial well, aircraft and other aerial vehicles that have served in theater but 
the personal story of individuals was something that we significantly lacked. So we went out and recorded oral history interviews and we did interviews, video recordings with, uh, with our recent and current serving veterans and pulled together the documentary Afghanistan, the Australian story. We still suffer from that lack of, uh, of having the rich richness of a collection to, t- in order to tell that story. But in, uh, in, in 2016, we opened an expanded version of the Post 45 galleries that included much more on Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and the Gulf War. But we compromised on space. In fact, the, the story that's currently dedicated to Australia's longest military conflict that is in Afghanistan is in an exit corridor. I, that's not that's not appropriate, <laughs> um, but we have to have something. And so, uh, I mean, from my perspective, uh, the the expansion of the memorials galleries has is has been a step in the right direction. Each museum, whether it deals with military history or not, has to continually active collecting in terms of telling today's story for future generations. As you work on that project, Aaron, um, and you start deciding as part of the team what will go on display in the new galleries. Will that concept that um, we are helping yeah. Afghanistan veterans relate to their service, will that be a, 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 an item in your mind or is it about telling those of us who weren't there the story? It's a little bit of both. I mean, uh, the vast majority of people who come to the memorial have very little concept of military history, of the military, um, or or you know their family's involvement in it or perhaps Australia's involvement in it. So, I mean, we have to keep uh, our broad uh, general public in mind. But of course, the memorial has always served a very specific purpose in terms of uh, for, veteran, for the veteran community right from the get-go. Um, when the memorial opened in 1941 and First World War veterans were taking their families through the First World War galleries and showing them the dioramas that uh, are have then and currently still are on display that was a way for them to describe the indescribable that that was it that was a, that was a deliberate effort for uh the memorial a, a, a deliberate function in terms of trying to get uh, trying to uh cater to the general public and try to understand what dad what her uncle um, what my brother had had lived and served through uh, and that's that's always been a constant throughout the memorial's mission over and the last 80 years. Something that strikes me when you were just talking about that, Aaron, is that um, I absolutely agree with that, that that's a, you know, a fundamental um, role that the memorial has served. Um, a slight distinction, I think, is just the nature of the military service today, that after the First World War, just about every family had a brother or a father or an uncle. You had the entire community had been touched by this war many thousands of families in a tragic way desperate to gain some understanding and so there was this huge aspect of the entire community like we need you know the war memorial is popping up in every little country town we need ways to express our grief we need ways to come to terms with something we never thought would ever occur and the war memorial obviously played a huge role in that how does the war memorial exist in this modern era where the vast majority of families have zero connection nor interest in military service. They don't know family members who've served. I mean, it's good in a number of ways because it means that we're not having these big wars anymore, but how does the war memorial continue to evolve and how do you get that balance right between veterans and the general public um, when the huge majority of people in the community today don't have any direct connection with war or military service? I guess the main thing is, is that even though uh, the Australian Defence Force has been involved in these conflicts in the Middle East, uh, well, more, Increasingly since 2001, but even before then, uh, through the Gulf War and the navels, uh, the Navy's uh, long-standing presence in, in the Gulf region. I mean, we've been involved there in, within a, in Australia's name. <laughs> that also includes the Australian public. So, whilst the Australian public may not be cognizant of the the level uh, of engagement and certainly the nature of the operations and how many Australians have been involved there, uh, I think the memorial serves a function in terms of telling people what's being done in Australia's name, what what ordinary Australians have been involved in over the last 25 years. 
uh, I, it's a it's a rich and fascinating story, uh, and one that deserves a much broader audience than it currently is receiving. And I can see Roger agitating in his seat. Here. <laughs> no, no, no. So no, no, no. I'm. Uh, well, I was what, thinking. What do you think, Roger, well, about the role of the more? I, I didn't, didn't want to turn Aaron off. I was. It was reminded of something he said, though. Um, it's ironic. There were probably more people involved in an anti-Iraq war demonstration in Sydney in February two thousand and three than have Australian servicemen who have served in all of these wars, because uh, one today's estimate is about one hundred thousand at one big demonstration. Uh, Australia now fights wars with a small, professional, almost elite group. Um, they're now a, a, an arm of, a, of Australian foreign policy and Australian government policy in a way that the big wars weren't. In the big wars, they were in, in and of the community. So I think there is... We look at things differently. The other, the other big problem that the war has got, and, and I know Brendan's spoken about this, is as the changing demography, demography of this country occurs, we've got all these immigrant groups now who are a very large subset of our country who've got no connection to Australia in either of the great wars and even less connection in a lot of ways to the current wars. So the war is facing a real challenge in how you talk to the whole population as opposed to that decreasing group who have direct um, either family or um, um, what's what um, personal uh, connection m- uh, yeah emotional connection mm. right? emotional connection to what you're talking about I mean if I'm an Indian immigrant from 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 uh, Delhi who's here because I'm an IT specialist did the Colombo plan and now I'm working in IT and my folks didn't go to the First World War as, well actually that's probably a bad example because being <laughs> you know, if I'm a Chinese uh, chap uh, who's out here because of my IT skills? Uh, what's the connection with this war memorial to my life? And well, I even, suspect not a lot. Even further to that point is that many of the the more recent arrivals in Australia have come because of these wars we're discussing. There's a connection between oh, that's true. Refugees, the, the refugees and warfare yeah, yeah. And, and, and conflict. So yeah. they're not people that are going to want to come down here and see the role that Australia played necessarily. I mean, what's the answer? It's, it's a fantastic question. Yeah. Is there an answer? How do we get in a evolving multicultural society how do we get people engaged and, and there's, in this history? there's another dimension this as well and this is one that the war memorial has to deal with all the time it's the philosoph- the philosophical position of do you centralize um, remembrance or you do devolve it after the first world war every town village whatever that supplied soldiers got a, uh, a an object of memory from the great war so if you if you were a town that sent 50,000 soldiers you got a few big large pieces of artillery which you put in the city park and everybody going to work every day saw it and, and were reminded of the families that sort of thing's vanished you've still got the war memorial and on Anzac Day it's happened and on, interestingly uh, and against my own theory the attendances at those war memorials seems to be increasing is that true? Yeah. Uh, whether that's because now instead of being lived memory it's now becoming a historical we go because it's a tradition rather than we go because I'm remembering great uncle Fred I can't say. You guys are better qualified than me. But I think the War Memorial is in this constant debate about should we... The the Imperial War Museum went through the same thing. They decentralised to Manchester. They decentralised up to Cambridge. Now, Cambridge was a technical... But Manchester Manchester seems to be going quite well. Is it time... Should the War Memorial spend its half a a billion dollars here or should they have spent it building, I don't know, an annex in Perth? Because if you're a veteran's family in Perth and not well off, how do you get to the War Memorial? It costs a lot of money to come over here to remember Uncle Fred. Uh, should there be somewhere over there to remind you, Michael? Um, I've got no answer to these questions. I'm just what raising about the, What about the cyclical nature as well? And I'm, I'm, Carl, I'm obviously very interested to hear what you've got to say as head of military history here. But what about the cyclical nature as well of Anzac Day that we've seen over the years that mm. Anzac Day has ebbed and flowed as, as more people have been interested and then after Vietnam they weren't? And, you know, attendance numbers have gone up and down throughout the, the, the century that we've commemorated Anzac Day. We're at a massive high point at the moment, probably as high as it's ever been. It's conceivable that that might wane as time goes on. That it, is it conceivable that that might, in twenty years, people might not be attending Anzac Day in such numbers, and therefore, does the role of the War Memorial then adjust as well? Because at the moment, you're telling all these wonderful stories at a time when everyone's very heavily engaged in the topic. In twenty years, that might not be the case. So, does the War Memorial continue to evolve then? Do, do, do you then have to find new ways of telling the story to get people reengaged? Yeah, I think relevance is always going to be key. Uh, and in many ways, while we're talking about the memorial and we're thinking about the site here in Campbell, uh, in Canberra, for example, the history of the memorial here is now 90 years old and really began on Anzac Day 20, 1929 with the dedication stone. 
So we've had nearly a century of the site of the building itself uh, changing and evolving and expanding. The memorial has always, not always, but has gone through many different phases of expansion, of almost renewal, certainly growth, um, to incorporate and tell different types of stories and different conflicts. So the building opened in 1941, not in the, as Aaron mentioned, this, during the midst of the Second World War. By the end of the Second World War, its collection had doubled because they were actively collecting through the, um, the war record section, for example, and the draft historical units. Uh, so the collection itself had doubled. Then in 1947, the Act changes to incorporate the War Memorial to incorporate what was then the Second World War, and we've seen this expansion ever since. In the 1970s, for example, the building, the wings were expanded. So when people walk through the main building, they see the First World War and the Second World War galleries. That's the 1970s expansion. Um, going back a bit, in the 1960s, the Roll of Honor, the Brass Roll of Honor, went into the commemorative area. In the 1990s, here, the Tomb of the Unknown, the reinterment of the Unknown Australian Soldier, um, and of course, Anzac Call in the in the 2000s so the, the site itself was always changed and evolved because partly goes back to relevance one of the big challenges i thought the organization may face at the end of the centenary of the first world war was the view or the perception that okay it's been 100 years the first world war remembered tick uh and the organization of the or the the building and the site here becomes a a mausoleum to dead white guys from 100 years ago i think with the organization senior leadership very actively moving into this space of focusing on a recent veteran, so that 100,000, for example, that is a good way to still connect with the Australian community. And it's something to keep in mind is that we're not turning off our interest or commitments to the First World War, the Second World War, Korea, and, and certainly not Vietnam. This is a, an active approach where we are focusing on and telling the stories of our modern day veterans at the same level and to the same, um, give them the same level of gravitas as their parents and uncles from earlier generations. And it's also a chance too, because the ADF has changed in the last 30 years in terms of its demographic, in terms of um, uh, you have Vietnamese descendants now serving in the military, uh, people from all over the world. The Australian Defence Force reflects the Australian society, its values, its demographic. So you get quite a, a mixture of some areas. To a degree. To a degree. Yeah. Um, but you've got the role of gender, you know, women in combat for the first time. So. It's a time for us to, by telling and focusing on those different types of stories, as well as the historical conflicts, we try to be relevant and connection. And I think in many ways, the fortunes of the War Memorial, in some ways has reflected the, the public engagement in Anzac Day. A great strength of Anzac Day, as I said over the years, is the way from 1980s onwards, it's changed and has evolved, become more inclusive of different elements of the Australian community. Um, and I think what we may find is that as the Australian public becomes much more informed and you have a higher level of discussion, Anzac Day may remain strong because of those imagined qualities of Australian um, values, uh, which now you don't get the same. Australia Day, for example, is much more controversial, much more rigorous debate. There's more rigorous debate in the public around Australia Day than Anzac Day. So Anzac Day is now almost our safe secular national day it's a good point let's talk let's move away from the war memorial itself a little bit and talk more about the general nature of remembrance in australia and how we feel it's it's going to evolve as time goes on let's start with the first world war centenaries uh because there is a question that now the centenaries are over are the centenaries going to generate a whole new interest in the topic of military history that's going to keep people engaged or are people now going to start to switch off did, did a lot of people come to the topic during the centenaries who now will go away and find another topic that interests them. What do we think? Yeah, look, um, the First World War centenary was a fantastic opportunity to remind people of the First World War and that for Australia, uh, there, was, there was much more to the conflict than 25th of April 1915. We saw much more of a nuanced discussion about uh, some of the other most significant you know, campaigns and actions that involved Australian troops. Um, there was certainly a greater focus on the Western Front and uh, all that Australia had lost, suffered and achieved, uh, engaged in the main theatre of war, for, in fighting the main, protect, or main, main antagonist of the conflict. Um, it's certainly scholarship wise, and I say this self-interestingly because I just published a book, or a couple of books during the First World War centenary, um, it, it produced scholarship. That was, that was readily available to a very receptive book-buying public. Um, that said, 
popular authors were able to belt out, um, you know, pot boilers and also sell them at great cost as well. Um, so, I mean, it was certainly a lot of a lot of interest. Um, you would have seen a lot of people traveling off over to the Western Front or doing on battlefield tours, in part as a pilgrimage, uh, other part as a, you know, as a learning experience uh, as well. And also an essence of, of, of being there, being connected to the First World War during the centenary period. I mean, uh, in 2015, we had something, something um, over 250,000 people here or something like that, some astronomical number. It turned out for the dawn ceremony and Anzac Day ceremony, the national ceremony here at the Australian War Memorial, in such numbers that never would have happened. Now, that wasn't repeated. Those numbers didn't certainly keep on going up and up as the time goes on. Uh, and certainly by 2018, we were suffering from uh, not only just the historians involved in the commemorations, but the public was suffering from commemoration fatigue. Mm. That sometimes uh, I think, uh, you know, I think perhaps that the media also to uh, the you know, other other sort of um, other people involved in this went really hard really soon around 2014 and certainly 2015. Um, you know, I think everybody was suffering from a commemoration hangover come 26th of April uh, 2015. Nonetheless, um, our role or my role specifically, also Rogers, was to, just to keep the interest percolating, keeping it going along uh, to remind people of the most significant aspects. Uh, among them, 8th of August 2018, the centenary of the, of the Battle of Amiens. Uh, of course, that involved the Australians as well as the Brits and the Canadians uh, in a very successful and very decisive action on the Western Front that played a key role in the defeat of the Imperial German Army on the Western Front. So, I mean, the First World War was great. Um, in terms of its commemoration, though, and um, Carl will love me for saying this, but it drew attention away from our ageing Second World War uh, veterans. Uh, we had a significant mm-hmm. series of 70th and 75th anniversary uh, commemorations uh, involving the Second World War. Uh, and uh, those veterans are in their late 80s, early 90s, uh, early 100s. 100s. Uh, I mean, they, they're not going to be with us for too much longer. What we knew about the 75th anniversary of the Gallipoli uh, landings in 1990 was that veterans fell off the perch very quickly thereafter. Mm. And in some respects, um, over-commemorating the First World War centenary uh, came at the expense of the Second World War veterans. And those First World War veterans, as you mentioned, 1990, the 75th anniversary of Gallipoli and then onto the Western Front, they had quite a bit of clean air at that time. There, were, there weren't other things going around, so we had a very strong focus on it at the time. And you're so right, the, the, the Second World War um, 75th anniversaries, which I always viewed 75th anniversaries based on the 1990 experience at Gallipoli as our farewell to these veterans. This is the last time you're going to get Hmm. a large group of veterans travelling to a battlefield or coming together to commemorate it because they're just going to be too old after that. And that did get lost in the noise of all the First World Hmm. War centenaries that were going on um, at the same time. Uh, I see it a little differently. Um, I see it like a rock strata. And you've got the volcanic rock core of interest. So there's a a horizontal core of people who will always be interested in these topics. I mean... I'm still interested in the English Civil War. I suspect my core of rock is very thin. But there'll be a, there'll be, I mean, I've got to go to Bendigo next Thursday and give a talk on the Battle of Menon Road to a bunch of enthusiasts in the middle of Bendigo. Um, so there will be a solid core of people who are always interested. Above that, there'll be a group who have a specific interest, whether it be through family or through uh, uh, some sort of experience, having been to one of these battlefields, or something, who will always have a general interest in it. Then on top of that, I see a large core, a large block of unformed rock, detritus, fed by the media, who are very always looking for some sort of story. So they seize on these things to fill newspapers, and then by filling newspapers, it then generates interest, which then creates more news, which then so it becomes a self-feeding cycle. And I think the First World War centenaries are a bit of that, and I actually saw that very much with Gallipoli. Uh, sitting as I was then as the head of the Army History Unit and we're watching things like the rate of growth in ministerials on this sort of stuff. If there was a popular story on something to do with Gallipoli that talked about some sort of family history, then you would get some interest. And and Peter Dennis and his hits on his big database, the AAF database. After a big popular media story, there would be a rapid increase in hits from people who were interested in looking at this sort of thing. I see those then 
as the as the current or whatever the sediment is blowing along, it'll descend on World War Two, because we have even more Australian families who were involved in World War Two, who when the media start talking about they're going to rediscover that they have these... I mean, I know my old man was a bomber pilot in World War Two because that's my business, I know that. But I wonder how many other families are going to suddenly discover that great-granddad was something in this war and they want to know more the, about it. Carl, have we missed the boat, though, on that? Because did the noise no. of the centenaries take away from the 75th so much that we won't have another opportunity to explore it until the centenary of the World War II battles, in which case there'll be no veterans left to tell their stories. Uh, So yes and no. So we're in the 75th right now, for example, the 75th period for the 1944 of 1944. Next year's the 75th fifth of 1945 so the end of the second world war but because it's such a long war we now uh, we've just had the it's also the 80th anniversary of the outbreak of the second world war so kind of it is it does go in goes in cycles but it comes back to what is it what you want to commemorate what do we want to remember what do we want to commemorate and what questions are we asking um i think there will be probably in the next 10 years probably a rise as the last of the second world war veterans start to pass and people realize oh actually there was this amazing generation uh, or generations because it wasn't just one but generations who spanned the second world war and as well as those who wore a uniform but it's also that family connection of people who lived through it you know, the, who lived through the blitz or the second blitz or can remember um ve day and vp day as that generation and even the holocaust as well you know so once you have that lived connection once the numbers of those start to pass then there'll probably be an increase because that was part of the pattern too with the 75th so there was this of gallipoli um big interest and then you had this counting down of each gallipoli veteran as they passed we'll probably get to the same point now what is the so what why are we doing that are we just remembering and publicly commemorating and celebrating their individual stories it's probably too late to conduct really useful and informative or um, oral history interviews for example because you'll be interviewing old men and old women who in their 90s um, and some of them in their late 90s some in the hundreds so some of those Tarook veterans who are still alive are over 100 it's great to meet these people and you do get a buzz it's almost like having a living relic um, not a relic but certainly that physical connection the physicality of it um, is always as exciting but do you want to get new questions new stories or is it more of a it's just a to say thanks granddad you know thank you for your service i really appreciate this and acknowledge the second world war was one of the defining moments in world history or global history as well as australia's history so uh, again it comes back to what are the questions what you want to achieve but i personally would always like to see more in the second world war what about other conflicts you know we've got anniversaries korea coming up we've got 50th anniversaries of vietnam popping up all over the place and that will be another long period of commemoration because of the the length of that war we've got the 20th anniversaries of australians uh, going to war in afghanistan in uh, right. november 2001 20th anniversary of and the invasion of iraq in, in, 2023. in 2023 how so do we, how do we find space for all this how do we when, if in well, any given year when there could be multiple anniversaries happening how do we find space to, to, go back to educate what? the public about it Go back to what Carl said, and I quite agree. If if a lot of this is driven by that family connection, because uh, or family experience, just look at the numbers. In the in the Second World War, there were a million. In Korea, there was one battalion for most of the war, and a squadron, and a ship. So we're talking about at max two and a half thousand people. Even when the other two battalions arrive at the end of that conflict, we're still only talking about another two or three thousand people. So we're talking small numbers. And small numbers equate to small family interests. And the, the other thing too, which is quite common when you go into almost a professional military, is that the same families tend to produce the next generation of soldiers. You look at the number of officers in Vietnam whose dad fought in Korea. And same in more modern conflicts. You look at our modern army. How many old dads were in uniform? Or in some cases, mums now were in uniform. So you're shrinking the body within the community that had a personal family connection to what you're talking about. For the rest of us, it was an intellectual connection because it was being done in our name, by our people, under our flag, with our taxes, all that sort of stuff. But we don't have that great granddad was out there being shot at. How important is that family connection? Because it obviously was very important in the First World War. It was very Mm. important in the Second World War because if you were a kid that grew up with a veteran father, you wanted to know what he'd done. That... As time has gone on and the nature yeah. of war has evolved, that's changed. And as, as you say now, we're, we're in an era where, um, and as you point out, Korea did not involve nearly as mm. many troops as the previous wars. And then we get to wars like the, the more modern conflicts where the numbers are, relatively speaking, very small of 
people who will now have a family connection. Yeah, in fact, they're is kept, it, kept by governments to be small. Is It's even government policy to keep them small. Is it important? How do we engage people who don't? It, it's, a, it's relatively easy when someone says, my dad fought in that war. I want to know as much as I can about it or my grandfather, or even my great uncle. When there's no family connection whatsoever, how do we keep people engaged? So family history and family connections make those conflicts relevant. When there isn't a family history connection, there is, uh, for the broad Australian public, um, they lack a, a form of engagement. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean they aren't engaged. It's they don't They don't have a personal pull or personal connection to that. Uh, the solution around it, I'd like to think, come to the Australian War Memorial, learn a little bit more about it, be engaged in some way, shape or form. I'll say from my perspective in the touring, because I feel that touring is actually quite a good barometer of, of people's interest because people who are willing to pay money to go and walk a battlefield is, mm. is, is probably the, 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 mm. the most intense expression of their connection. And we find it all the time that people, firstly, people want to visit battlefields that are, that are in places they want to go to. So France is always our most popular destination. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a very strong family connection, and even if it's something a little bit ephemeral like a great uncle or someone that wasn't a, a particularly strong connection, but it still gives them context to want to walk the battlefield of Gallipoli or to walk the ground of um, the Western Front. We see many less people wanting to go to World War II battlefields because even though there was a strong family connection, there's, there's less of an interest in going to World War II battlefields because they're in obscure locations. But then we get to ones like Korea, and I'm a huge fan. Korea was the first battlefield I visited. I love the story of the Korean War. Um, and people say, oh, it's the forgotten war and we should spend more time focusing on it. We have tried and tried and tried to run tours to Korea and there's just not interest out there. And, you know, I, I think it is a big factor that people don't have a strong family connection. So my, I, I guess my rather long-winded question is, is the Australianism of the fact that Aussies walk this ground or the, as you say, Roger, the intellectual connection or the patriotism, is that enough to sustain remembrance when we, when we start to lose those direct family connections? What I found was an area that surprised me and is a growing interest is the way in which, and I think this is quite a good development in some regards, it's moving away from the family driving the interest in the individual. We're seeing a lot of local history now, and when they're telling the story of a district, so I remember dealing, there's a bunch of guys in Bundaberg who are trying to tell the story of the, the evolution of Bundaberg, and a critical part of that story is the, the ebb and flow of people going in and out of military service and experiencing. So we were getting a lot of requests for information about the service of a number of individuals because Bundaberg and the area around Bundaberg was taking pride in what it did. In fact, I think a couple of guys up there are trying to rewrite history and claim that it was actually the Bundaberg Battalion of the White Bay Regiment that stopped the Germans in, in April 19, in 1918 and after all, therefore, they should be credited with winning the war. I, I hadn't uh, heard that chapter. Uh, it'll come. It'll come. It, they're, they're getting a book done or something. But nonetheless, uh, that is one area that I'm seeing is, is people are now looking, I think, finally putting the military history into the context of the whole of societal history. And I think that won't ever go away because people really don't want to understand you know, where they come from, what they're doing, why they're doing, what, why it is, you know, what, why is that thing in the middle of the intersection in our, in our town and all that stuff. And I think that's a growth area that will keep it alive as the family interest drifts off. It won't be nearly as powerful, but it's still there. Um, I also think as we... Um, you look at the way in which the school curriculums are changed and the way in which they had to fight vigorously to put the First World War back into the New South Wales uh, school curriculum. I think as long as those sort of battles are going on, people are going to want to know why, and therefore they're going to be interested in the study of this period. So I think when that's going on, that'll move in a bit to fill a bit of the vacuum of the declining personal interest. But I don't think it's ever going to be, it's never going to compensate totally, because the number of people that, as you say, on your tours who want to go and visit Great Uncle Fred's grave is, is 10 times greater than people who want to go and visit so-and-so's grave because he came from the same town. They're there and they're growing, but they're not growing at the same rate as the, the other one is declining. Well, that's a, a good concluding thought, Roger. Um, Aaron, concluding thoughts about all this? Concluding thoughts about all this. I'd love you all to go out and buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless. Yeah, look. Um, no, look, uh, I can't really top what Roger, what we've discussed here. I think it's, um, yeah. I mean, commemoration is a shifting, uh, shifting beast i mean it's a 
there's no set defined way in which the which uh, Australian military history should be commemorated or remembered. I mean, as as Carl said, it's a it's a broad church, and uh, I just hope the memorial and certainly we as historians can fulfil a role within that. So, yeah, well said, Carl. Final thoughts. It's been interesting to reflect in this discussion because I think one of the ways is while we obviously have a bias in, say, Australian military history, it's our passion and it's our profession, um, it, history itself is a huge topic. It's the story of people and where we came from. So I don't really think there is a perfect answer. I don't think we can ever get this magical gold standard of enough commemoration or enough dis uh, discussion. So, for example, when we're talking about commemoration reflection and um, telling these stories and going to the battlefields, a lot of that in itself is focused on those who died, who made the supreme sacrifice. But I think, Roger, your favourite uh, fun fact is that, what, five of the six five Australians... Five of the six Australians came back and yeah. built this country into what it is. Why aren't we talking about their story? And that's something I think which is something which is a lot of the... During the centenary period of the First World War has been lost because so much of it was on those who died. The majority came back and they built... Well, and then they came back, struggled through the Depression... Um, in the 1930s and then sometimes themselves or their children served in the Second World War and as the Second World War generation that built modern Australia um, so we should really be thinking about or they came to Australia because as a result of the Second World War whether it be post-war migrants from Britain other parts of Europe around the world and the people who've come from the, uh, you know, from the 1970s onwards have been conflict their experience of conflict is very different because they've been refugees, they've displaced people, they've left their country of origin or birth to come to Australia because we are, by and large, a peaceful nation and society. Um, so, I mean, war and conflict has shaped Australians in many different ways. It's not just about the diet, those people who died in France or Belgium. Um, and we're still really grappling with uh, what happened on the Australian frontier. You know, that was one of the defining conflicts of Australian history, the, the battle for the Australian continent from 1788 onwards and then you have the world wars as well as being the big the big questions the big stories there's lots of things for us to ask and reflect on and to consider I think so it's not just about um, our military history I think it's about Australia's history there must be I would always be a strong advocate of telling more Australian history any final thoughts Roger um, I've often wondered how long um, the First World War, because it was such, the First and the Second World War, because they were such huge national events. But in a sense, they were in the same proportion as the Napoleonic Wars, and we don't have huge, we do have the Waterloo Memorial, I guess, but not many Brits visited, I guess. I just wonder how long uh, memory will sustain the physical manifestation of memorials to those conflicts. Uh, one of the questions I used to ask when I was a historian on your bus trip with my buses was, if this was Australia, how tolerant would our farmers be of half of their agri best agricultural land being covered in cemeteries to people who were not French? And for how long do you think they'll stay there? Because uh, that's revenue, you know, rate revenue gone. It's, it's agricultural land denied them. Uh, how much longer will they tolerate their presence amongst, amongst them? At the moment, it seems infinite. But in another 100 years, will they still be there? I don't, I don't know the answer to these questions, but it was something that puzzled me. I, I couldn't see Australians putting up with that belt of memorial to a conflict which is 100 years ago and where they weren't because their people were further south. I understand the French cemeteries because they're French. Uh, and I've never forgotten the comment from a French when we were, I was engaged in the um, recovery at Framille and I was talking to a French officer, I think he was a colonel, I think, and he said, I don't understand you people looking for your dead and trying to put them in graves. Like he said, they're buried in the soil of France. What greater honour is there? <laughs> it's very well said. I, I've really enjoyed this conversation, gents. So thank you for taking the time to do it. And it, it, it's fascinating, the evolving nature of remembrance. And as much as we would like to have a crystal ball, I don't think any of us will know how it will go in the future. But for the meantime, it's wonderful that people are engaging so strongly. They're coming to the War Memorial in such numbers, buying great books like yours, Aaron. Absolutely. Going on battlefield tours. Uh, with my company in particular. Um, it's great. It, it, we're privileged that Australians engage with this topic so strongly. We take it for granted when we speak mm. to people. I mean, I know you guys speak to a lot of people from overseas and understand this as well, but people overseas are always looking in awe at the way Australians engage with military history. It's really wonderful. Um, let's just hope it continues. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thanks for having us, Thanks, man. Yeah. Okay.